Heaven's Gate, Cult of Cults, 2020. Marshall Applewhite and Bonnie Nettles believed, truly believed, that they had the answer. And what answer is that? Well, the ultimate answer. What is it all about? What's next? What's on the other side? They had the answer. And they wanted to profess their beliefs. They didn't have to profess it to the world, so to speak. But there are certain people that had to know. We're going to dive into this documentary called Cult of Cults done by HBO. And we're going to do it in the actor's room. I hope you enjoy the show. My name is Jeff Tarowski, and here we go. We all want to believe that we have that special moment where we get that revelation, the the sense that we really know what's out there, what the future brings when we die, and what that all means. But we're never going to know. Our human brains will never figure it out because when you're dead, and I mean really dead, not coming back, you'll never reveal your story. And we may get into near-death experiences, maybe in this podcast show of cult of cults, but maybe not. We'll see if it pertains. I want to give my opinion on near-death experiences if it pertains to this documentary and the show, it might, it might not. I just don't want to start off my show talking about it. But here I am rambling about that. So let's get into the documentary. Hi there. My name's Jeff. Uh, my documentary shows are a lot more popular than my actor or movie shows. So I hope that all of you out there are doing great, enjoying your day, and I hope that. You may learn something, and if you don't learn anything new in my show, at least you get an opinion or just some comments about this documentary. I love diving into them. These subject matters are unbelievably fascinating. I had known about this Heaven's Gate because, you know, I was alive when it happened. And for a fleeting moment, I thought about it and let it go. But now that I'm getting back into documentaries, um, I saw this on HBO and went, great. I want to know more about this Marshall Applewhite. He was the white-haired guy, the crazy guy, uh, talking. All you see is his face, and he's talking about this Heaven's Gate. And he convinces how many people? I have it written down. 39 people. He convinced 39 people to commit suicide. At his order. So needless to say, even though that guy was batshit crazy, and he was. There's no doubt about that. (laughs) But he was very persuasive. He had to have been. And very smart. These are two dangerous things. Am I right? And if you surround this guy with vulnerable people, (laughs) something bad might happen. And it did. We're going to talk about this in sections. Because there were three parts or four parts. I think three parts of this doc. Three episodes. So we're going to go by episode. I thought, hey, might as well do that instead of one long show. I don't think people really like listening to one long show. If you break it up, that might be a little better. So that's what we're going to do. And it might bring up a little bit more uh, comfortability with me. So I feel like I'm not rushing. So sit tight. I hope you enjoy it. I'm kind of excited about this one because it's so unbelievable. The things that happened to these people is so incredibly tragic. It's sad that people are this not only vulnerable, and they are, they're they vulnerable too, but they're so in search. You know, they're, 
They're searching so far deep into themselves that they're willing to throw everything away to die. That's how unhappy they are on the planet Earth. That's, and that might be a conclusion too soon in this, but we're talking about this. In my opinion, might change throughout my show. Uh, that might happen too. I always go moment to moment. That's how I was taught in acting school. Moment to moment behavior and thought. But before I move any further, and we're talking about Heaven's Gate, and I've mentioned Marshall Applewhite. Crazy guy. Well, he wasn't the only one who started this Heaven's Gate. Bonnie Nettles was alongside, and in my opinion, the mastermind and soul of this cult. We'll get more into her later, but for now, let's start, of course, at the beginning. The very first scene. You have the um, goodbye messages. (laughs) This scene is, I believe, the day of... Or before these 39 people decide to kill themselves. It's like a little goodbye video. Creepy as all can be. And these people are weird. I mean, let's get serious for a moment. If you watch the doc and look at these people. They're not drugged up or anything. They're, you know, they're not high. They're, they're just... They've been listening to a psychopath, crazy person. That's the only information they get. News, whatever, was from Marshall. So they've been listening to a lunatic for how long? Because they're pretty much closed from the outside world. You're going to go nutty yourself. They look like good people, though. Nice people. And they're saying all these weird things. They, They all look the same. They got pretty much the same haircut. They wear pretty much the same kind of clothes. Uh, They have to button up their shirt all the way. Because that's what Marshall wants. And they're saying goodbye. And giving their reason why they're doing what they're doing. Don't hate us. Don't judge us. This is what we want. Is it though? Is it that what you really want is to kill yourself? And if that's true. Then this story goes deeper than anything I've probably ever done. On this show. Because once you make that call. Boy. I mean that's a hell of a call you're making. Out of every decision you've made in your entire life. (laughs) I mean that's the ultimate. Making that call. Where you're just going to. You're going to kill yourself. That's. uh, Suicide is. Is something that. I mean you got to be so low. And what's ironic. Is that these people claim. They were the opposite. They were so high on this that they were willing to kill themselves. It's a different dynamic here. It's so fascinating. This idea. I mean, what did Marshall tell these people that got them so revved up to kill themselves? But that's the opening scene. And I want to see if I have notes about, yeah, the fact that Marshall Applewhite was referred to as Doe. And his partner, who had passed already when they committed suicide, Bonnie Nettles, she called herself T. The scales, when you're practicing choir, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. I guess Bonnie was a big fan of Sound of Music. I've never seen that movie, have no desire. I do like some musicals. I like to sing. But for some reason, I, I can't watch that movie, Sound of Music. Why is that? I'm sure it's great. I just have no desire to see it. But there's a, a song that uh, Julie Andrews sings about Do, Re, Mi, all that stuff. They called themselves Do and T, the leaders of this cult. All right, so during the very opening scene, Marshall Applewhite points to one of the members that are sitting down in front of him, and he asks him to stand up so the Guy stands up, this weird guy. And uh, Marshall tells him to show off his uniform. They're all wearing these uniforms. <laughs> like Star Trek. I guess they were big Star Trek fans. That's fine. Star Trek's great. But they're all in uniforms. 
And the member, the one guy that stood up is dressed all in black. And he has a short, distinctive haircut, like I mentioned before. They all have pretty much the same haircut. And they look strange, I put. All of them. Not just a couple. <laughs> not just, like, oh my God, you know, that one and that one. They're really gone. They all have that spacey, sort of lost look in their eyes. Dazed, yes, the look, but also weirdly content. Like they're, they don't look like they're distressed in any way. They just look like, hi, how you doing? My name's Jim. I'm in a cult and I'm going to kill myself tomorrow because I believe that's the right thing to do. And I want to see what's on the other side. And I believe the aliens will take us to the next level and we'll harvest. Folks, that's what they'd say. <laughs> okay, and Marshall then has the guy show off some sort of patch that they all have on their uniform. This patch. It reads, Heaven's Gate Away Team. That's it. Heaven's Gate Away Team. They have been all gone for so long, right? And they can't wait to get back to the aliens. They think they're aliens. That's the impression I get. Uh, We're all aliens. Okay. That's what they're saying. Is that we're all aliens. But some aliens are more in tune than others. And Marshall and Bonnie. Okay. In the very beginning. Starting this call. Believe that they were the messengers. They were enlightened. Receiving the information, we'll get into that later too. But I'm trying to set up what they believe. They believe they're aliens. And there's certain aliens that will be taught this message and have this information. And that's great. What? <laughs> mm. Continuing on with this documentary. So the opening sequence ends... With a quick panning of the entire room. Showing all the other members. Of this alien cult. And they all have that creepy distant look in their eyes. Almost like. They've been hypnotized. And have they. You gotta understand. They've been told for years. That they're aliens. Not of the earth. And from the looks of things. That sure appears to be the case. They really do think. They're aliens. 39 members voluntarily committed suicide for their leader, Marshall Applewhite. But was this really a suicide? Could it have been murder? Another fascinating question. What happened? Was it a suicide? Or was Marshall so convincing, so manipulative, I don't cut things out on my show. Everything you hear is first take. And when I mess up, I'm just going to leave it. But the word I was looking for and was tripping over was manipulated. Ah, No, he was a manipulator. Did he manipulate them in terms of that? To commit suicide. And then... Because he did that, that would be murder, correct? Do you see where I'm coming from? Think about it. Might be something we'll also bring up at the end as well. And I find it really cool that this little cult back in, uh, I believe they started in the the mid-70s, correct? It, It made the news. Walter Cronkite actually did a little piece on Marshall and Bonnie. And the reason why it was sort of a big deal was because Marshall and Bonnie had meetings about their little cult. And all of a sudden, I believe it's uh, 20 to 30 members went missing or not just people at that time. Nobody knew they were members yet. They were just people going to a meeting. Well, after this meeting, they disappeared. Why? 
Because Marshall and Bonnie convinced them to drop everything, like not even notify their families, and just leave with them. There's nothing creepy about that. All right, we get our first character in the doc. Uh, that was a member, former member named Sawyer. Uh, he talks about his experiences in the cult, and he's strange. Then you got Frank, also a former member he talks to, also strange. What a surprise. They were both turned on by the message of feeling as though you don't belong on the planet. So, translation. Frank, right? Frank and Sawyer explain that they go to the meeting. And they're so pumped. So interested. That they're willing to drop everything. Because the the message and the way they felt about the message about not belonging on the planet. So these are people that are outsiders or feel like they are. I mean, don't we all have these feelings at one point in our lives? We don't seek out cults, but some people do. That's how unhappy they are. They're so on the outside of what is normal reality that they feel they need a cult. They need other people that think like them or feel like them to belong. It's like they're surrounding themselves with people of like mind. And not feeling like you belong on the planet though. And that you might be an alien. This is not unusual. I think a lot of people have felt that because they feel so lost and uncomfortable around people. People that are really shy. I am really shy. Still am today. And I do feel like an outsider. Because I I find it hard to fit in. To a group setting. I shut down. I get scared. I feel everybody's looking at me. Because they're just pointing out and dissecting me. Oh, you know, he's going bald. Oh, he's got that, you know, speck on, on, on his cheek. Or, you know, he walks funny. You think, and that might be the case. We judge. And you feel so vulnerable, so sad, and so on the outside that it's almost possible that you don't belong on this planet because you feel so awkward that maybe I am an alien and I need to surround myself with other aliens. That's how unhappy some people get. And I'm now starting to understand us, the members of this cult. Uh, Both Sawyer and Frank remember the first meeting uh, and most of all the founding members. That's Marshall and Bonnie. Uh, They were also uh, referenced as the two. (laughs) The two. Uh, In the very beginning, that's what they wanted people to call them. Uh, Now, not just Marshall, but someone else was by his side. Of course. We've referenced her already many times. Bonnie Nettles. And here we fucking go. This lady almost looks like an alien to me. There aren't many pictures of her. And there's not much footage of her. But the footage that I have seen of Bonnie. And please tell me if I'm wrong. But she really does think she's an alien. There is no doubt in my mind. It is just plain as can be. A hundred percent. You take a look at that woman. Sitting at one of those meetings. And you have Marshall just. And she's just sitting there. She looks like an alien. She thinks she's an alien. And it's coming through. Like her eyes look alien like. And she's like thinks that she's turning into an alien. And I think if you think that so much. It comes through. And I'll tell you this. There isn't enough information about Bonnie. uh, For my liking. I try to look up more information on her, uh, more discussion talk, somebody out there that really knew her, or had stories and things like that. I really wanted to know more about Bonnie Nattles because I think she was the brains of the operation. I do. And I want to know her story. And there's not much to get into. She was a nurse. She had a family. Uh, she was into, you know, uh, mystic stuff, occult stuff. I mean, the other people that are involved in that too. I mean, 
I wouldn't prefer it. Uh, but, you know, people look into that stuff. They're searching for new things and just trying to get a taste of other things. But then there are other people that really get into it. Uh, the, the, the searching or the discovery of it is, um, is so fascinating, so intriguing, that they're now drawn to it. And they're getting answers from this shit. The occult. And the fact that around that time in the 70s, the, the whole UFO thing was the flying saucer phenomenon's going on. You have people thinking they're seeing flying saucers in the sky. When it's not. I mean, come on, people. Have you really seen a flying saucer? Really? And if you have, reach out to me. Talk to me. I'd love to hear your story. I really would. You have no, I was obsessed with aliens and UFOs and shit when I was a kid. And I would have, you know, although they, they scared me to death, and they did, I always wanted to see one. And, you know, I've seen a few lights in the sky that we couldn't explain, but I'm sure it could be explained. There are so many weird things you see in the sky, comets, uh, whatever. There's a lot of stuff up there and shit happens up there. And then uh, whatever, the eyes could play tricks on you. But, but the case is, Back in the mid-70s, flying saucers was a phenomenon, a, a cool thing to look into. Uh, and like the science fiction thing was really exploding at that time. And it really expanded people's minds. Uh, new uh, ideas of religion, too. Because back then, you had Christians and Catholics and any other denomination, um, you know, whatever. Whatever it was you were into. Uh, Buddha, Buddhism, whatever. And this is uh, these cults or new ways of religious thinking and science fiction thoughts. People gravitated towards that. They just did. Uh, they wanted to think more for themselves. And there were other possibilities out there. And people's minds and souls just went crazy. And you get these people that are so open, too open, folks. Come on now. Aliens? <laughs> Aliens. Aliens. Come on. Let's really think about it. If there were really aliens out there, for real, and I'm talking about little green or whatever color they are, gray, if they really did exist, these little people, and they're hovering around out there, okay? They're just watching us. And do you know how long it probably takes them to get here to just watch us? Why wouldn't they make contact? Why? Where's the solid proof? We'll never get it. Why? <laughs> because they don't exist. Demons? Maybe. Now, now we're talking. That scares the shit out of me. If aliens do exist, they're, they're freaking demons. And now we're talking about Going outside the dimensions and then, oh, you know, getting contact with that. Uh, they're not from other planets, folks. They're from, like, other... Uh, maybe there are people that can explain this to me. And then I think, I don't want to know. I kind of do. And <laughs> no uncertain terms. Okay. I'm going to put it this way. These figures... The people sort of admire and want to meet someday, they don't have good intentions. Uh uh. uh they're more bad than good if these things exist. I think they're demons. That's what I think. And uh, these Heaven's Gate people believe that they're aliens, which means they're evil, right? And that these uh, evil UFO flying saucers will take them to the next level of enlightenment. Okay. It's like levels they're talking about. So what's after that? Is that it? How many levels are we talking about here? And have we um, graduated before? Right? Like how many times have we graduated? Ten? Are there ten more graduations in our future? And then, is that the ultimate go goal? To be an alien? A demon? Looking like them? Maybe! Is that why we're here? To eventually look like little gray people with big eyes who can look like insects. The little mouse, like they don't eat or nothing. Right? This whole thing fascinates me beyond levels. <laughs> Let's get back to the Doc and 
just rambling on. Rambling. You could definitely let me know. Jeff, get a hold of yourself. Rein it in. Get to the information. Get back to the doc. And, but there's other people that like to hear me go on and on about certain beliefs that I have. Although it probably is not even close to what you believe. It's fine. There aren't many people that agree with me. These are my own thoughts. I think for myself, I've been fascinated with the whole concept of uh, other beings or what else is out there. Uh, People practice all sorts of black magic that fascinates me because I'll never, ever do it. I just like hearing stories about it. Getting to the other side. Okay. I hope to do that when I'm like 80, 85, you know, in my sleep someday, experiencing the other side, knowing I had a great full life. Not like these 39 people that most of them were pretty young. And deciding to leave this planet happy and healthy to go to the next level. That's how unhappy they were. But Bonnie, getting back to Bonnie, the most fascinating character in this story, in my opinion. She always wanted to be an alien. Her daughter is in the dock. She explains this, how she loves her mom, loved her mom. Sorry, because Bonnie has passed. And how she would take her to acting classes, singing classes, dancing classes. They would do things together. Um, And uh, they would also talk about, you know, spiritual stuff, which is great. I love doing that with my family. We don't do it often, but every now and then we get a little deep. But I don't think it's healthy to be talking to your children about that stuff. Especially occult stuff. All the time. And I think that's what Bonnie was doing. She was so overwhelmed with this stuff. That I think she talked about it all the time. It wasn't just something she was interested in. A hobby. Something she read. This was consuming her. She would sit outside with her daughter. At night. And the both of them. Would look up into the sky. And they would do this often. And dream about what it would be like. If the aliens would come down and take them away. That's healthy? That's not healthy. Mom? Mom? uh, That's not healthy. Uh, You talking about aliens coming down to take you off of Earth. That's not healthy. And you shouldn't be telling that to your daughter. Uh, If that's how you feel, I would keep that to yourself or maybe tell friends. (laughs) I wouldn't... (laughs) Okay, you're talking to a vulnerable kid that looks up to you. And I don't think it's a good idea because, I mean, look what eventually that turned into in the future. And I'm not saying Bonnie had the same vision as Marshall. Because if you've watched the doc and you know this story, you know where I'm going here. Because the, the suicide thing was Marshall's idea because Bonnie was dead by then. It may not have been in Bonnie's mind to even... Think about doing anything like that. She just thought she was an alien. She thought she was enlightened. And she needed to share her story. She was an egomaniac. Wanting to feel important. Plain and simple. Bonnie in a nutshell. Lunatic. Crazy. Wanting to be an alien. I guess intelligent. Because you have to be. Or just imagination filled with so much. I mean. Think about the information, this nonsense, because that's what it is, Um, this idea. And I've read some of their literature. I've, I've read some of their books. And I mean, this is stuff that was well thought out. You got to give them credit for that. Even though it's kind of crazy, and it is the whole idea, you still have to like put it all together and Her and Marshall did that in the future. It took time. But it started with Bonnie in the late 60s. Talking about it with her kids. Talking about it with herself. (laughs) I don't know how many people she told. But I think she was starting to think that she was really an alien. And it got stronger and stronger and stronger. And then I think that uh, eventually, you know, there's like a little coil in the brain and it snaps. Bing! 
and then there's no turning back. You can't fix that, folks. When you're when that spring or whatever it cracks, breaks, it's it. It's over. They're loony. They're they're not right, and now they become a bit dangerous too. We can get back to Bonnie later on, but for now, let's get back to something else. The meetings that these two ran back in the mid seventies. Let's get to that. Hundreds of people would show up. No shit. And only a handful would actually stay to the very end. Which means their bullshit <laughs> didn't seep in to the populace. It was just a couple that it actually reached. But that's, that's still impressive. If a couple of people are still like, I want to hear more about this cult. You're going to do. And the aliens. Because I think I'm an alien too. Uh, We got to talk about why uh, Bonnie and Marshall called themselves the two. This is why. They convinced themselves to be directly connected to the Bible. How connected? Well, they were actually characters in the book of Revelation. That were the two witnesses of the end of the world. They had come to teach the process to go to the next level. A metamorphosis, they say. If you follow their approach, they will turn into a space alien. I mean, they really will physically turn into an alien. The UFO will then pick them up and take them away. Cuckoos of cuckoos, folks. Cuckoo, cuckoo. Members say how persuasive Marshall Applewhite was. Those are the dangerous ones, aren't they? The really persuasive ones. They're charismatic. They make great salespeople. They can sell you an idea. They can sell that idea to almost anyone. And the person considers it at least. And the really vulnerable ones... They take the bait. And they believe it. Whatever that this this person, this persuasive person is telling them, they're buying it. The information they were spouting gave some audience members feelings of grandeur, they say. (laughs) They were in awe of Marshall. Bonnie, too. Marshall seemed to have a glow around him, they say. A glow. Marshall and Bonnie gave out a glow. And folks, this, you know, I'm not going to make fun of this. Because this shit actually happens. And it's, it's not something otherworldly. This is all in us. When we're so full, like, when somebody is so charismatic, okay, And so good at what they're doing. So passionate about what they're talking about. I mean, they believe it so deeply, it's getting to you. Even if you didn't believe it, you're like, damn, this guy's good. So if you get a vulnerable person that's willing to listen to you, really open to it. Like, hey, I'm here, convince me. And if they're so convincing, like, you get that that rush, too, that they're they're so excited about. Like, you get excited, too. You're like, yeah. It's like almost like getting a speech or uh, a coach talking to a team before the game. Yeah, get them all revved up. Going to kick some ass. And that's what they're doing with these people. They get so excited. This is my message. And it, it's this is so... And, and if the people in the audience are wanting something. And they're, they're feeling that they need this. And, and then you have Marshall just giving them all this information that they've been looking for. And yes, I agree. The person talking to you is now larger than life. You know how we have idols and people we look up to. They're on another uh, plane, another status. They're now, and and this is kind of messed up, but it's true. We do this to some people that we look up to. It's natural. There's nothing really wrong with it. You just got to know where to place it in your value system. You can't be placing these people so high that now they are more important than things that should be more important than them. That makes sense? Did. Rewind it, listen to it again. But anyway, (laughs) what I'm trying to say is that people get so excited about something that you can get yourself so revved up and then our brains take over. 
First, it's our emotions. And then it's our brains. And people will actually seem to give off like a heat, uh, a presence, the it factor, where they now are like elevated. Like, you get it. Like, wow, they moved me. That's what, that's how good Marshall was. He was fucking good, this guy. Really good. You convinced 39 people to kill themselves? I mean, this guy was saying something so amazing. <laughs> it's all, oh, 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 oh. And he's not the only one. There's been other cults. Look them up. We're talking about this one. Cult of Cults 2020, done by HBO. There are some members, this blows my mind, that state they felt they were in the presence of Jesus. See what I'm talking about? That's incredible. And Marshall believed he was Jesus reincarnated. So there you go. So these people left their families and were told to bring camping gear. On the road we go and we're going to learn as we go. Sleep in tents and then uh, talk about aliens and how they're going to take us to paradise. The documentary takes us next to an important topic in the story, the time frame. This took place in the middle of the 70s. It was a time of spirituality and experimentation, especially with drugs like LSD. People were searching and opening their minds. LSD can damage your brain. Uh, An example, shortly, Pink Floyd, the original singer and member of Pink Floyd, Sid Barrett, lost his freaking mind by doing too much acid. Look it up. And some of the band members of Pink Floyd agree that Sid pushed the limits too far with LSD and he was never the same. It's a very dangerous drug. It alters your mind. It opens doors in your mind that should be closed and are closed for a reason. Okay, Our brain doesn't allow certain doors to open for a reason. We're not ready, folks. We're not ready to see this shit. And a lot of people freak the hell out on LSD. They can't handle it. They can't take that reality. Okay? Our brains are so advanced. We can't... uh, The things our brains can do, we're not ready for it yet. And you do LSD, you're seeing shit. You're getting enlightened. Your things are moving around that shouldn't be. Uh, You're seeing things that aren't there. Okay? Don't trust that. But people see it. As like the spirituality thing. Folks, I've never never done LSD. Never. Because it his drugs are so fucking stupid. Don't do drugs, kids. That's the best advice I can give anybody. Not just kids. Just don't do them. They are bad. They're just... All of them are bad. 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 <laughs> Simply people were searching and opening their minds. People want to be enlightened. They want all the answers. Good luck with that. Heaven's Gate was a Christian offshoot, which I found interesting. Uh, be prepared for the end was the message. Uh, and you know that's with any religion. And I'm, I was Catholic. I don't know if I still consider myself Catholic. I don't practice Catholicism anymore. But I, whoa, when I was a kid, I went to a Catholic school. So I was in church a lot. Um, and it almost seems like you you get the messages, you get that, you know, Jesus is important. Mary's important praying, uh, feeling sorry for your sins and preparing for that ultimate day. And so heaven's gate sort of touched on, uh, Catholicism, Christianity, uh, there's Jesus, uh, Jesus was the ultimate, And, you know, we have this information, uh, we're tuned into the Bible, and we're preparing for the end and what's going to happen after that. And people are fascinated to know that information. What was I? Wait a minute. You know what happens next? They're going to be interested. But to be so egotistical, I'm talking about Marshall and Bonnie here, to be so egotistical. To think that your message is the message. (laughs) You're the only ones that know this? Okay. And the only way other people will experience this is through you. 
Like, you got to be so high on yourself, unbelievably high on yourself, to believe this, right? Get the hell out of here. Marshall, 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 Marshall Applewhite. Nickname was Herf. Yeah, I'll say that again. Herf, spelled H-E-R-F. I looked up his yearbook on classmates.com. And his name in the yearbook is Herf Applewhite. Herf. I mean, they had nicknames back then, silly ones. Um, But his real name's Marshall. He ended up being a college professor teaching music in Alabama. And he had a wonderful singing voice. Excuse me. Ah, I guess he had a wonderful singing voice. And I've heard him sing. I agree. The dude could sing. Uh, He was also homosexual and this bothered his father. His father was a preacher, I believe. And when uh, Marshall came out to him, the dad was very upset. And I think disowned him. So Marshall, this is, you know, feeling this, this pain when your father denies you who you really are. I'm sure it crushed him. So now he has identity issues. Uh, the fact that, you know, he's homosexual and that's wrong and how dare you. Uh, that'll do a lot to your psyche and your identity. So it's safe to say Marshall had daddy issues, right? Uh, it happens. I guess Marshall ends up having an affair with one of his students. Uh-oh. <laughs> Him and this other guy. Well, he was married at the time. Marshall. Okay. Wife found out, of course, and they divorced. So how does Marshall meet Bonnie? How do they meet? Did they run into each other on the street? No. Did they meet at church? What? (laughs) Did they work together? No, they did not. There are a few versions of how they met. One version has, and this is from Marshall. He says that he was visiting a friend in the hospital where Bonnie worked. She was a nurse. And that's how they met. They struck up a conversation while Marshall was visiting a friend, a sick friend, at the hospital. I don't think that's true. I think the story that I I think is true is uh, someone that knew Marshall uh, said that he was in a musical and a pretty big role in the musical where he had to kind of go deep. And uh, I think he went a bit too deep and was under a lot of stress at this point in his life. And was um, he had a breakdown? Um, I don't know if a meltdown, breakdown, or some sort of um, I don't know where he kind of lost it. Uh, I'm trying to think of the the word. It might come to me. We'll just say a breakdown, a nervous breakdown. And so he went to the hospital to be treated with this ailment. And at the hospital, he happened to be the patient and body was the, the nurse. I said body. Bonnie was the nurse. And you must know this. Bonnie was told by um, people that do fortune telling thing that she was going to meet a tall, handsome man. <laughs> and she'll know when he, she meets him. And they're both going to do wonderful things. And she's been told this a few times in her fortune telling sessions. And when she meets Marshall, he's vulnerable, tall, handsome, and very vulnerable. I think that they had a certain connection and some people do. Um, I don't know which party maybe initiated at first. I'm thinking it's Bonnie. And Marshall being in a vulnerable state at that time was more open to Bonnie's shenanigans. And you have to understand, too, it's a perfect combination because Marshall, in his past, has also dived into certain thoughts, opinions, passions of spirituality. And you get these two. It's like this perfect uh, combination. Sometimes it takes two to make things go right. Or wrong. 
And remember how I mentioned uh, earlier how I felt that Bonnie to be the mastermind behind the operation, right? Well, I feel she didn't have all the tools to do this. She didn't quite know how to present it. Well, that's where Marshall comes in, I think. He is her muse and her tool. They bond and they bond big time. It's never sexual. It's spiritual. Marshall was fragile and he had the same ideology. She convinced him that he was special. Bonnie was deep into mystical thinking and was told by that fortune teller, you're going to meet that guy. And she did. T recruited Doe, meaning Bonnie recruited Marshall. Together, they were going to work on a dream project by God. (laughs) She was the force. And that family aspect thing. Where they're all going to be like this family. All the members. They're going to be. You can leave your former family behind. We're your family now. (laughs) So now the doc. Has Bonnie's daughter talk. And her name's Terry. Terry Nettles. She says my mom was a nurse. She was a good nurse. She was a baby nurse. She loved it. Terry considered Bonnie her best friend, not just her mother, which can be dangerous. Uh, I don't think parents should be best friends to the kids. Nah, those are friends' jobs. Your job is to be the parent. She was, hmm. They spent a lot of time talking about aliens. I mentioned that before. Bonnie would also do seances. So the mom's doing seances. Is she doing it in the house? In front of the kids? Folks, I think she was. And that's messed up. She was channeling shit. All that stuff. Terry explains how she would sit outside with her mom and fantasize how great it would to be aliens. The marriage collapses. Bonnie's marriage. Because Marshall, he's around. They're buddies. Weird. Oh, by the way, hun. Yeah, hubby. Uh, This is Marshall. He was one of my patients. And now we're best friends. Is that okay? Or she didn't even ask for permission. Marshall just kind of hung around. Got the... What is going on, right? I'm sure the husband's like, what the... I knew my wife was a little... (laughs) Like, every year she's just a little weirder, you know? She's one of those people. Now she's got this guy... I'm out! (laughs) I got to get the F out of here. This is nuts. I'm done with the seances. There's cats everywhere. What the? Pretty soon she's going to be flying on her broom. And I hope she takes this Marshall guy with her. Because I'm out. Bonnie decides to hit the road with Marshall. Or Herf. Whatever. She needs to find answers. And she needs to do it right now. The answers they find. As they go on this journey. Is that they are the two witnesses in the book of Revelations. They are to be killed. Then rise from the dead in three days. Very Christ-like. This is when the aliens come down. And then they take them to the next level. They're just saying it out loud. Like I read this before. When, it, when I say it out loud. It's so comical. That people can believe this. It's, it's incredible. Uh, they also felt that. <laughs> Sorry. They also felt uh, with a powerful enough telescope, <laughs> they could see God. Where's that uh, telescope that we got from NASA? Bring that over here. I want to see God. Hi, God. I'm waving. What if he sees me? I know I'm, be- I'm being silly, folks. I believe in God. But I don't believe that we could build a powerful enough telescope to see him. But that's what uh, Marshall and Bonnie believed. Or was it just what Bonnie believed? And she convinced Marshall. Hmm? Uh, I love the next lady in the dock. She's sitting on this beautiful couch. And after the whole telescope thing, she looks into the camera and says, I think they did acid. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) 
I mentioned that before. I think they did. I agree, lady. I think they did a lot of acid. Oy vey. Um, they said, Bonnie and Marshall said, they wanted to shed humanness. Wow. That's a what the fuck moment. Because that message signifies how very unhappy they were. It's plain and simple. They wanted to be another being. They felt uh, the, the vehicle, our bodies were called vehicles, right? And you, like, they're nothing. They're just a shell. They're not a part of you. Folks, they're a part of you. Okay, as much as you may agree about souls, and, like, there's a certain light inside of just the, of the being, okay? Uh, I'm talking to you, and I have eyes, and I'm looking, and my body allows me to feel uh, uh, my body gives me so much. Don't tell me how worthless it is. My body almost gives me everything. The, the food I taste is because of my body. The air I breathe, my lungs allow me to breathe the air that comes into me. So don't tell me how it's just a vehicle. Yeah, it is, but it's a pretty damn good vehicle, isn't it? It allows us to heal from uh, viruses. <clears throat> Strong. It is. The body's very strong when healthy. Fights off all the bad shit. Boy, there are, these were unhappy people spiritually. Not physically, but spiritually. They were torn, ripped apart, not thinking they belonged. And were so unhappy, they were willing to just end it all. Robert Bulch is next in the documentary, and he's a sociologist. He wanted to do research on cults and felt that Heaven's Gate, why not? <laughs> Let's do it. Um, he went to a meeting. He witnessed strange behavior and was intrigued. He had his friend Dave Taylor come along for the ride. His friend Dave was also into that stuff and was able to sort of, uh, you know, take the time to go along and go undercover going into a cult. That's awesome. If I had the means... I do that too, man. Not now, but I'm saying in my late, early 20s, late teens, that area. If you, know, you got nothing else going on, right? Not married, have kids. I'd uh, go undercover in a cult, you know? And I guess this guy was taking notes and everything. It's pretty cool. It doesn't say how long he was there, but, you know, a considerable amount of time, I guess. Robert Balch wanted to meet the two. <laughs> he found the cult to be very secretive. And hard to meet the two. He had to go through some sort of scavenger hunt to join the cult. They led him to a top of a mountain. And then two cars pulled up. And he was told to get in. And they drove away with him. Creepy as shit. <laughs> they led him to a top of a mountain and everything. That's crazy. Robert did his best to document his research. Writing on little pieces of paper and napkins. Whatever he could find. He even pulled out one. He kept. Uh, he felt that there wasn't much authority in the cult. This is so fascinating. He says there were, it was a more of an individual thing. Uh, attachments and addictions had to be shed. And not a, many instructions were given. And it was just the message that was important. And it, the individual as opposed to like having a boss. They made them feel like they really were part of the two and their belief system. Um, I don't think they felt that the members felt that they were being looked down on. Which is very clever because they were being looked down on. They were. Uh, Robert felt that the main thing was tuning into the next level. Uh, the note A would be played on a tuning fork. You know those tuning forks that you, you hit and it goes... Well, I guess... Uh, I guess the note A would be played on the tuning fork and they'd strike it and they put it on the top of their heads and meditate to get in touch with the next level. Members were also told to knock on doors to spread the message, but no money was given to them. They weren't backed with anything. And if they had to have money or make it, they had to do it on their own, figure it out, donations or get part-time work. They would tap into the next level. I don't know how they did that. 
and then go out into the desert okay, and look up into the sky. Will the flying saucers come today? Will, it, will this be the night? Can you imagine that? These people going out into the desert at night, looking up and, and actually thinking, boy, this could be the night, guys. Like, they're all looking around like, hey, this, is, <laughs> this could be the night, right? I mean, we've been out here for three weeks, but, you know, and then one time we saw that speck. Remember that? But, I mean, this could, like, tonight, like, around 11, 1130. That's nine now, but it's great. They'd be great if, like, they came down right late, like, about 11, right about 11. Oh, 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 give me more of that acid. Yeah. Here's a question. <clears throat> Is there a certain personality type that join cults? Um, I say yes. Professionals say no. Um, I think that, yes, there is a certain personality type. The vulnerable people with damaged spirituality, damaged souls, uh, outsiders. I think that's a personality type. People, uh, other people say, no, these are smart people. They're educated. They're, you know, they're, they're good people. Well, that might be the case. Yeah. But they're all searching for something. They all have something in common, you know? I mean, I don't think my neighbor John is going to go join a cult because he's a good guy, he's well-educated, and then no. But, you know, if he was vulnerable to it because he had a really, really damaged soul, then yeah. If some persuasive person knocked on his door and was telling all the things that John wanted to hear, he might go off with that guy. I mean, it's possible because he has that personality type. So I disagree with professionals. I say yes, they do have a very similar personality type. The fact that these people encourage their members to leave their families and children, you know how I feel about children. Okay. Children are the most precious beings on the planet of any species. This goes for puppies, kittens, little ducklings, whatever the case is. Children, the most precious beings on the planet. And these buttheads, these uh so-called great people are telling their members that have kids they have to leave their families and their children. Where the message is more important. What you're doing is more important. Don't feel bad about it. This was meant for you. This was your destiny. It's okay to leave little Johnny and little Billy and little Susie. It's okay. Unbelievable, folks. Unbelievable. And then, just as unbelievable, you have the parents okay with this. <laughs> At least some cults, they brought the whole family, which is messed up too, because cults usually turn sexual, deviancy, blah, blah, blah. So maybe in that way, the kids were spared. Okay, so maybe there's a server lining with that. But for parents to abandon their children because of a cult, and thinking you're an alien. And then a, you, the, the lady in this doc is one of the daughters of former members. And she was told this by her parents. Honey, we're going to join a cult. You're not going to see us again. And the daughter crying. Saying, why? <laughs> what are you doing? And they explain it to her. And she goes, aliens? What? And she was a kid at the time. Trying to talk her parents out of it. A kid having more common sense than the parent. That's reality, folks. There are kids out there with more common sense than their parents. It's fact. Okay, now we got to talk about the Jesus angle with this whole the, the theory of uh, what they're doing uh, in comparing it to what Jesus did. Because Jesus told his disciples, the 12 disciples... To follow him. Drop everything. Leave your families. And come with me. That's what there's. <clears throat> Number one. Um, I get that. And I sort of set up. and went Interesting. Because that's in the Bible. That's true. I was taught that. So they got a point. That these members. They were so into it. And then. Marshall says, well, that's what Jesus told his followers. So, uh, and that's, that's true. That's in the Bible. Okay. But you also have to uh, like uncloak myself in disgustingness because Marshall is comparing himself to 
to Jesus. Jesus. Oh, you know, the guy that we, you know, celebrate Christmas for and have a whole month of Christmas songs and presents. Uh, and the guy that we celebrate Easter for because he rose from the dead. That guy. Marshall's getting on his level. Okay. You might be a very, very small prophet. Maybe. <laughs> but don't do that. Because the, cause I really thought about it and went, whoa, they're blowing my mind right now. Like my mind. Because I'm like, whoa, yeah, right. So I have to understand this, right? And then like, I, it's like I hit a wall. Like I just like you're running in the dark and I hit the wall. I'm like, ah, wait a minute. <laughs> Marshall and Bonnie are comparing themselves to God and Jesus. Yeah, good luck with that. And now, right, you're back to being batshit crazy. Okay, now we're wrapping this up. All right. The media ends up shedding so much bright light on the cult that the identity of Doe and T is revealed. And they're just getting too much attention. And because of this, there are some members that just can't take it anymore. So their numbers decline as far as membership. The newspapers are calling them freaks and con artists. And we're talking about Bonnie and Marshall here. And they should be. T, or Bonnie, even gets up during a meeting and states the harvest is over. She's frustrated. (laughs) All this attention and pressure and everything, they figure they have to, like, go into hiding. So just a handful of members remain. Bonnie and Marshall look out among the diminished group And say this to the remaining members. You made the final cut. No. Take that back. You made the first cut. The end of the first episode is so telling. Marshall explains to his members that they will go into hiding because the outside world thinks we're crazy. I mean, who do these cult leaders think they are? Jesus? I mean, the media is saying that I think I'm Jesus? God? Uh, yeah. <laughs> you think you're God and Jesus. Bonnie thought she was God. And Marshall thought he was Jesus. Folks, this doc sent me to levels of uh, uh, talking about otherworldly stuff and religion and And uh, I love diving into that stuff. Uh, Always did. And uh, I think a lot of people are fascinated with that. And uh, I hope you continue listening to my other episodes about this documentary. If you're interested in the Heaven's Gate lore and all that entails. uh, I was kind of going off the tracks in the first episode, folks. I'm doing the best I can. I'm not a seasoned vet. Uh, I'm very passionate. I like to joke around. And I don't mean to be insulting. I just, I I entertain my very small audience. I do have an audience. It's not that big. And I just have fun. I I take topics. I discuss them. I get entertaining with them. And just have a good time. Hey, I help you get through your day in a certain way, maybe. Uh, Maybe you, you put on a podcast to wash the dishes. That's what I do. I put on a podcast when I'm folding the clothes. Hey, uh, I'll put it in sometimes when I'm driving to work. And maybe that's what you do. It's something just going in your ear, this stuff, and maybe you laugh and chuckle every now and then. Or you get some information, you go, I kind of agree with that. Right on. (laughs) Right on, bro. So I hope everybody's good. Hope you enjoyed the show. This is The Actors Room. Please support it. Go to iTunes. I'll go to the website, theactorsroom.lipson.com. I have a donate button on my show. I haven't got a donation long time. That's okay. I, I never beg for money. I just appreciate anything anyone can give. A dollar, five cents, whatever. It, it's thought that counts. The money's fine. That's great. Hey, you know what? Fine. I put a lot of hard work into this. I put a lot of time into this. 
and I've been busy. So that's why I haven't been doing a lot of shows is because it takes time to do these uh, research. And then I, I watch a lot of stuff and, um, I also want to give a good show. So I, I want to make sure that you're getting information and I sound like I'm not completely stupid and that I might have a few good ideas. So I hope that you have a great night. Put in that movie, one that you love. But watch a lot of James Caan. I miss him already. <laughs> but we still have his movies to watch forever. Yes. And tonight, I want to do something sci-fi tonight. I know it's all this uh, Heaven's Gate stuff. I want to watch maybe Blade Runner, the original Blade Runner with Harrison Ford. I fucking love that movie. I've been watching Star Wars. Every now and then I'll put that in. I have it on DVD. And uh, my favorite is Empire Strikes Back. I think that's the best one. I watched that live in New York City uh, in a the theater. They reshowed it in New York City, I think in 1998. I went with a you know a group of friends and we sat there and watched it like we were watching it in 19... When it came out, 82. When I made up a year. I don't know the year. But it, like we were, went back in time. Like we're watching it for the first time. And I'll never forget that. And Empire Strikes Back is the best Star Wars movie for me. I enjoy it very much. Uh, maybe I'll put that in tonight. I don't know. Uh, maybe I'll watch a sci-fi movie I've never seen. Do something new. Hmm. Maybe I'll do that. So I hope you put in a movie that you enjoy. Uh, one that you've seen before makes you laugh. Maybe tonight you just want to laugh. And then there's nights you want to be moved. You want to cry. I get like that. Uh, a little tidbit of my show before I take off. Personal stuff. For people that don't really give a shit, click off. It's personal stuff, but if you're intrigued to know about my day or you know whatever, you know something stuff that goes on with me, some people might find that interesting. Uh, my daughter Madeline got her license today, driver's license. It was a journey. Uh, it, it was hard for her. She's afraid to drive. You know, she's so adorable, you know, and, and she, she doesn't want to hurt her car, our car. Uh, she doesn't want to get in an accident and driving scares her. And it took her a few years to get her license. She failed the first time, the driving part. And it was such a long break be- between the first and second test. She had to redo maneuverability. We didn't know that. We're like, oh, you don't have to worry about that. You passed that. So she had to do both of them today. And I was like, I was so nervous for her. She wants it so bad and so do we. So today was a great day. She got it. Got that license. It's a big step in anybody's life. Remember that? When you got your license, you feel grown up. You know, it's a big step. Big step. You know, all the responsibility now. Uh, although exciting can be scary. And she's a really, really good driver. Uh, for now, she'll be going from home to work and then back home. We can keep it simple, build up that confidence. All right. <laughs> I had to say, because I'm beaming today. I'm in a good mood. Great. I'm going to do my show. You know, I'm, I'm just, uh, it's a great day. So I hope you had a great day too. Watch that movie. Enjoy it. God bless you. Have a good one.